We loved it. Um, Thank you. Definitely a, like something I've never seen before. Alex yeah. called it like a hangout dock. That was uh Yeah, I was I was um uh, like I really like hangout movies, you know, the kind of movies that you can watch again and again. Mm. Like they can be a lot of different genres, but there's that certain, you know, like once upon a time in Hollywood is kind of like a hangout. You know what I'm getting at, or like yeah, Friday you're vibing, you're like vibing a, with people. I think yeah, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't meant to be like this. I mean, I was, I imagine so, but it I it did give <laughs> me very unexpectedly that feeling of like I don't even I don't really I don't even know what's going on, but like I feel like I could just like watch this again, and maybe that's his seductive power in a way because I felt like I did feel like I was going a little mental, but I also was like just so effective yeah oh no that's good effective. i mean i think i yeah i mean essentially in this documentary you're hanging out with me and my documentary subject who i'm trying to figure out and i guess the audience is trying to kind of figure out with me and whereas tickled was about this man who was always off camera and always so elusive and only appeared in the film for a couple of minutes you know of its 90 minute runtime with mr organ very early on in the film, um, you know, sort of the guy that I'm running up against wants to be in the movie. <laughs> and so we start spending a lot of time together and I just film with him for, you know, across four years. Uh, and yeah, weird things happen. You know, I think often, you know, a lot of true crimey kind of documentaries, and I don't think that's what this is, but you're looking at something after it's happened, right? So someone's in prison or someone's died and you're looking back on, this life they've led whereas this is all kind of unfolding in real time which i don't think you get to see too often and i think that's yeah. a really interesting aspect to the stock yeah, does that remind you of any of your questions yeah uh what was your original intention like before you figured out that he was manipulating people this way what was your plan i mean i my original plan was to you know i knew there was this man in new zealand who was like a low grade kind of con man but i also knew his main passion was sort of like psychologically tormenting people and so the original plan was for me just to meet his victims and kind of figure out how he worked and how he affected people so much and i guess and and michael organ you know mr organ wasn't going to be a huge part of it on screen but very early on he because he's a giant narcissist he wanted to be on camera and then he kind of started working on me, which wasn't expected. And so it almost ended up being more about me and him than anything else and sort of what unfolded there, which is this maddening, strange, quiet, unsettling thing. You know, it's not it's not an action film. Uh, it's got no car chases like it hadn't tickled. It's like very unusual and very low key. So is that what you would say that's why he is the way he is? Because he's narcissistic or... I think I think this is someone who has a lot of things going on. You know, I'll never be inside Mr. Organ's head, but there's there's definitely an element of narcissism there. And that was part of the both the fun and the horribleness of making this was that I was dealing with someone who would one day be my enemy and the other day would be my friend and you it would just mm -hmm. be a dime. And I think part of the interesting thing of watching him on camera is just when he's gonna flip into these different versions of himself and i mm -hmm. found that an incredibly frustrating difficult thing to be around i think on camera it can be fun at times i mean there's a time where he you know mr organ serves me legal papers uh <laughs> and is really angry with me and then i just occasionally say to him would you like to get a coffee and he just says he agrees and he's oh yeah no we'll keep hanging out and it's just this very yeah. strange relationship that was a weird moment and you're you definitely sounded pretty drained so is that like a moment that had played out before this kind of like suddenly we're fighting and now i i know exactly what i need to say to keep you on the line or... oh yeah i mean no that was me at my absolute like wits end i mean i wasn't yeah. saying would you like to get a coffee because i was trying to charm him into sitting down and having a coffee it was almost i was just so sick of all of this shit. yeah i just came out with a line which was oh do you want to get a coffee and i didn't expect him to turn around and sit down with me again you know the, so the many things thing... in this odd planned and i thought that happened in a certain way but everything i planned just went in a completely different direction it was so weird because there was so much tension it was very uncomfortable 
and then oh, good. I think it was I was in that in that well in the whole movie, but in that scene especially, you could tell where you were at with it, and I'm like, okay, I get it. This is uncomfortable, but he wants to keep talking to him. He's making a documentary, and then the fact that he instantly pivoted from I'm going to sue you until you commit suicide to almost making a joke like, oh, I could do an Irish coffee. It, it, it's so odd that he he capitalized on this moment where he's like, oh, bullying's done. Now I've got something charming. And Oh, yeah, he was just someone, you know, I think we go through our lives being able to pin other people down. And he is just someone that you could never pin down. And that's part of why I was drawn to him. I was like, what makes this fucking guy tick? Like, what is he doing? Why is he doing it? And and I think, you know, I think we all run into various people like Mr. Organ in our lives. Like we've all had like, I don't know, people, even family members or people we've dated that are like this person. And I think part of the reason I wanted to make it was to sort of put that personality up on screen so people could watch and kind of go, oh yeah, I've, I know what he's doing now. I've seen an element of that. And he's just such an extreme version of all those things. It's kind of more entertaining, but I wanted people to sort of see this type, this personality type reflected back at them. Um, and yeah, part of the fun of, you know, we had a whole year of touring this around America and film festivals. And I got so many people coming up to me afterwards saying, oh yeah, I know this type of person yeah, yeah. We and said that, that was out. that was yeah that was that's you know i think these low grade sort of psychological tormentors are out there amongst us and i think that's kind of scarier in a way than the than the murderers and the other kind of people we typically focus on in these kind of films for sure so you said that you knew him for four years you were hanging out with him about i mean maybe six years for six years first time i sort of saw him and finished the film yeah six years later so how many times do you think you hung out with him in person? Oh, I mean, you lose track and it's the thing. It's like, it's not like we were spending months and months together. It's more the way he just integrates himself into your life. Like it's the phone calls and the messages and the legal back and forths. So he just, and, and you'll, there'll be months where I wouldn't see him or hear from him. And then something would happen, you know, and things suddenly quieten down. And then suddenly he says, oh, I've had a key to your house for the last year. Things like that. So he just finds ways to integrate himself into your life. Um, what do you think? Uh, how do you think he got that key? What's your... I'm, I have no idea. That's like one of the many things I don't know. We We don't, we didn't have like a missing spare key. I think... He was probably watching the house and when no one was there, he was alone at the house with the door and probably, I don't know, tricked a locksmith into back in, you know, cutting a key for the door or something. It would have been a very pedestrian, boring way he did it. But yeah, just having someone who you don't particularly want to have, you know, imagine the one person in your life you don't want to have like your front door key and then that person comes up to you and says, I've had it for a year. It's a very unsettling thing. You didn't mention this in the documentary, which did you change your lock right away? Oh, instantly. Oh, yeah. No, locksmith was in there the next day. And security <laughs> well, cameras were up. Security cameras are up and the lock was changed. Yeah, we wanted sure. to ask about that if you had any kind I don't think anything like this came up. And I was I was anticipating it. How much of an effort did you make to catch Michael doing something on camera or to kind of trap him? back and go beyond the conversations that you were having with him i mean in a perfect world i would love to have him doing something uh something i don't know i don't know what that thing would be on camera but i mean the thing is what makes him so kind of the point of the film is what makes him such a smooth operator is he's not doing anything particularly lawfully wrong it's mm. all psychological games and so mm. yeah. really i think the only way you could kind of show how this person operated was like in his effect on me almost and sure we meet a lot of his victims along the way but he's too smart like he's he's not doing anything to capture in a way that's going to be a big gotcha like his way of working is just like slow methodical psychological manipulation and again i think that's kind of what makes him more scary than someone who was out like you know, yeah. doing some particular criminal enterprise, you know? 
Yeah, because there's no one to blame. If anyone, there's no one to blame. Him. No, that's the thing. He's, you know, this is a film about someone who is um, committing no crimes. That's the thing. He's not committing any crimes. That's kind of the point. And yeah. so, what? Where does that? You know, where does that leave society in dealing with someone like this when he is invincible and he's just out there doing his thing? And so, the film is kind of like pointing a camera at this sort of person that um, is technically leading a ethical life. You know. Wow. So does he still contact you? No, well, I mean, I part of the reason I came to America was to cut that off, you know. So I live in a different country now. Um, you know, he's used the legal system in New Zealand to get at me. That's his that's been his latest move, you know. So if the if you're due in court when you're in America and New Zealand, you still have to turn up on Zoom, that kind of thing. And so he finds ways um, to poke at me, but being geographically a 12 hour flight away has definitely been a really big help. That's good. We read in an article that you did that he was showing up at viewings. Yeah, um, he did, yeah. So wow. in, in the film, a lot of this documentary takes place at this big old historical bank building that he lives in. And opposite, uh, in the town of Whanganui in New Zealand is the local cinema. And so Mr. Organ played at that cinema. And yeah, he went along to most showings and he uh, he would watch this film and he talks a lot in the movie and in the in the, in the cinema for hearing from people that were in what there. He also he a lot. What kind of things was he saying? That oh, you just heard? endless narration about no, this is wrong, you know, just usually just poking holes in everything on screen, you know, because uh, of course, in his reality, everything I say is always wrong. And so he was just there uh, sort of critiquing the film live. I mean, I wish I could have got a microphone in there to record him because it would have been like an amazing director's commentary track on the Blu-ray, just having Michael Organ's take on oh, yeah. the film for 90 minutes. That would be kind of wild. But it's funny because, you know, in Tickle, David D'Amato, he turned up to screenings of Tickles in really? um, in LA. Yeah, he turned up. If you if you search for the Tickle King uh, on YouTube, we made like a twenty minute follow up for HBO, and we had cameras uh, in the cinema for when David D'Amato turned up. And he he bought popcorn, he bought a Coke, and he sat in the cinema in the middle of a cinema with people watching himself on screen. And for the audience, that was a crazy experience because wow. you're watching it with the main big bad. And so you've had multiple times. This is kind of your your thing. This is, is my you... genre is making documentaries <laughs> where the bad guy turns up and watches with the audience. Like it's better than like 3d cinema it's fully interactive like um, emotive experiences that i put on for people that's horrifying <laughs> i can't even imagine what that would be like to be watching it was scary i mean it's easy to laugh about in a way but no for the audience it was scary i mean he well especially is... since he had to be getting i mean this is like the ultimate porn film for him i mean he must have been yeah. just rock hard that entire screen yeah, and that's such a no, and that's a tricky thing right because he's a narcissist so yeah. it's pretty unusual thinking you know this person is getting enjoyment out of this critique you have made of ab about him that's mm -hmm. like a very interesting like place to sit you know wow that's crazy okay do you have like one or two more burning questions that you want to definitely have answered here look at your list uh... and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I was going to ask you, did anyone approach you after the documentary came out saying that they had experiences? Oh, so many people. Yeah. I mean, I get weekly emails from people that um, that knew Michael at school or at university or have been unfortunate enough to brush up against him. Um, and I wish I could say they were like, it's all the same. It's just people that he has derailed along the way. It's the same wow. story that rolls out every time. But yep, yeah, and people are still discovering him. I mean, he's still he's still taking people on a ride, and they come to my film afterwards because people sometimes don't Google people's names, and when they eventually try to find out what the fuck happened, they'll Google his name and they'll come against my documentary and watch it and sort of go, "Oh my god." Um, I wish I'd seen this a month ago or six months ago, or I wish I'd seen it 20 years ago. It's, it's such a, yeah. 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 He's a busy person out there in the, in, in, in New Zealand. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I have a quick question. Okay. Yeah. Hit me. It's okay. If I do a fun one, Yeah, go you ahead. got all that. I think that, yeah, it's so interesting. I just want to say it's so interesting to 
talk to you after the fact because this mm. is such a living, breathing story. Like with all the things that happened to you with him in the in the theater, you know, and on a more personal thing, like what you were saying about how he's not really doing anything that bad, and yet the people you talk to about him say that he's worse than Satan and people yeah. are jumping off the earth to get away mm. from it. I mean, it really does remind us of people we know, like some mm. family members where it's like, these people are draining our soul and yet it's hard to really pinpoint a certain yeah. thing they're doing. And if you bring it up, you sound like the, the, the crazy, crazy one. one. So a hundred percent. And yeah. I guess that is like it, it I, I think, I mean, that's why I feel really, proud of this like very weird documentary is that it kind of in pointing the camera at someone like this and spending 90 minutes with them you kind of see how these types of people operate out there and how they yeah. can get into your head and ruin li a, a life you know and there are countless examples of that in the film and i certainly yeah it's a really hard documentary to explain to people as well like what's yeah. mr organ about you know and i think like, our tagline we came up with was like it's a story of like psychological warfare and it is it's just what happens when someone like this you encounter and they ingratiate themselves in your life and you can't get rid of them and they just find ways to like the little tendrils into your brain and where that leaves you like it's a really mm -hmm. it's a really friggin unusual documentary and i don't think there's anything like it out there and i think people either love it or they'll hate it as well and i think mm -hmm. um i kind of think that's great like if people come away arguing about what the hell this thing was about i think that's it. that can be a good thing yeah do you think you would have kept going or did you stop because you were oh i wouldn't i mean no i mean i i wanted to stop but i kind of couldn't stop because i was so far in it was such a difficult film to make, but I'd, you know, I'd by then I'd promised people that were had, you know, talked to me that I would be able to tell their story and that, oh. you know, that mm. this crazing that happened to them would like have a place and a reason. And then I was so trapped in it, I sort of couldn't get off. So I wanted to get out of this film, but I kind of couldn't, you know, until the end when I ended up at that old psychiatric hospital talking to people there and getting a, sort of an understanding of of Michael's brain you know when i was in that psych that that psych ward i knew then i had an ending um and mm. then it was just a matter in the edit of making sense of how to to tell this very confusing odd story and the the edit took a very long time but i'm pretty yeah. happy where we got things okay so david mm. be michael's roommate for a month mm -hmm. or film one video for the tickle king Oh, I'd film a video for the Tickle King anytime. I'd be I'd be tickled for a month before spending like another a day with Michael. Easily, wow. happily. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we can't wait to see who shows up to your next premiere. Thanks. And... I can't wait. I can't wait as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe do a documentary on like the coolest nicest people in the world or something yeah uh, i think i think that but then i think god that would be so boring wouldn't yeah. it yeah. yeah do you have anything coming up are you working on anything other than your podcast and no voice i mean i write a newsletter called webworm where every um every uh week i sort of do a weird internet rabbit hole deep dive so webworm's a big part of my life um i make that a couple of times a week and flight this bird about american culture i make that and yeah, all the time I'm keeping an eye out for what the next documentary is going to be. So there are things burbling around, um, nice. but you know, it takes me a couple of years to make a thing. So mm -hmm. I'd say we're a few years away, but I've always got, yeah, I've always got weird things I want to sort of poke into, you know? That's great. All right. Can't wait. <laughs> well, it, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for no. Thanks for your yeah. enthusiasm and uh, thanks for time. Yeah, appreciate it, Mr. Organ. Where is it? It's out on digital. It's on Blu-ray. If people like, like discs, DVD. There's still DVDs, which is crazy. For sure. <laughs> yeah, we should buy it on DVD. Follow <laughs> David on Instagram to stay. Uh, follow David on Instagram to see what his next project's going to be. Listen to Flightless Bird, and uh, you're in LA right now. I'm in LA. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now enjoy LA. Can't wait to hopefully talk to you for your next project. I'll talk to you in a couple of years. Thanks, okay. guys. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, David. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See ya.